Welcome to Voices. Welcome to Voices with Raveki. Um, it's my great pleasure to once again, this is his third time, uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Craig Henriques. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, a really core part of his work. It's not, it's not the entirety of his work. Uh, Greg's work is like Hegel's. It's this comprehensive, <laughs> huge thing. Uh, not, not I'll take that reference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, so uh, I want that you know, clearly understood. But I think there's a part of his work in particular uh, that jives with a lot of my work. And especially, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it especially relevant to this whole project of, you know, trying to get back to uh, dialectic, the Socratic way of life, and the integration of sort of transformative psychology, psychotherapy, and uh, cognitive science. And Greg is very much a partner in that whole project. And so I'm very yeah. excited to have you here again, Greg. Welcome once again. It's so great to be back. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation. It's always a lot of fun. And I think, as you know, John, uh, I just have such deep admiration for the work you're doing and the changes you're making in this world. So, Thank you. Uh, so, Greg, in case people haven't seen the previous video, could you just uh, quickly do, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 an audio CV really quick about who you are? And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm a professor of psychology uh, at James Madison University. Um, I'm a member of what's called the Combined Integrated uh, doctoral program in clinical uh, and school psychology. It's a program I directed for uh, 12 years, but then retired so I could do more of my scholarship. Uh, so I'm really interested in theory uh, and practice uh, in psychology and organizing uh, the field's research uh, in big picture ways uh, so that we can generate uh, a language of talking about psychology that's actually coherent and there's consensus about it and we have shared terms. Um, and we connect to cognitive science. I don't think that psychology should be terribly split off from cognitive science yeah. and those kinds of things. Um, and I'm actually very, very, as my last, uh, as the pedagogy psychotherapy video, I really believe we're in a very important time. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the kairos of the moment, of course, there's the pandemic. But I really believe, you know, if you track this thing I developed called the tree of knowledge, it says that we're really in this very, very important time with the emergence of the digital age and all the changes that bring to bear. And we need good sense and meaning making systems um, help us uh, to make a quick, I think really requires a pretty quick transition over the next three decades into new ways of being. Uh, and we need really good knowledge systems and we need wise values uh, and we need to uh, mesh those together. So that's what my big picture passion is, uh, finding uh, ways of awakening to the meaning crisis uh, and addressing those so we can find a path uh, towards uh, more wise living going forward. That's excellent. And um, I really recommend you guys check out the, uh, the, the, the two previous videos with Greg, uh, especially the one we did uh, that was sort of centered around uh, the COVID and uh, what, what's that, what that is doing to people. Um, so today, uh, let's not talk about the pandemic if we can. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I was like, I'm, I can definitely take a vacation for all of that action. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've had a lot of very, uh, I think, very good um, and in-depth and really richly reflective discussions with people about that. But, but I want to now turn back to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working towards this project, the After Socrates project. Yes. And really trying to understand... Um, the functionality and the normativity that regulates the functionality of distributed cognition. Yes. Um, and what's called collective intelligence and ways mm -hmm. in which we can analogously, like we do for individuals, can we get collective intelligence into collective rationality, into collective wisdom? Mm -hmm. And I take it that um, there was a project um, in the ancient world that starts around Socrates and then it has a long history afterwards. Yes developing this practice of dialectic, which was both an intrapersonal and interpersonal practice. Yes. And Chris and I, Chris Master Pietro and I have written a few, uh, a couple of things on this already, a book chapter and a couple other things. Uh, there's been lots of discussions I've had with, you know, uh, Guy Senstock and Jordan Hall and Christopher Master Pietro. And you and I've had one around yep. this whole idea. Um, and then I, I, the thing is, I'm not, I'm not, not uh, anachronistic. I'm not trying to bring that back, but I'm trying to mm -hmm. understand that um, yes. in order to put it into, and I sort of intend this pun, into dialogue with all these, all these emerging practices that are trying to tap in uh, to distributed cognition and Brilliant. collective in, in intelligence so that we can get, um, as you said, uh, much more powerful tools 
of sense making because normative structures are not made by individuals they're made by cultures right yeah. and so uh -huh. um i think we not we need to get a very clear understanding of that now what i wanted to bring up in particular given that sort of context was an idea that i have been uh, talking about and developing also with uh, the book i'm writing on the cognitive continuum with daniel Gregg. um this idea that we we've gotten a shift um into monologic reason uh where it's a we get a, the classic example is somebody presenting an argument or a treatise yep. right and right mm -hmm. even as late as you know aquinas uh, philosophy was still written in a dialogical manner a dialectical mm -hmm. manner um right. and so one of the shifts that happens although you can also see it earlier on in the shift from plato's dialogue uh, to Aristotle's monologues is this shift to the monological model mm. of reason, and and then we and then of course that gets very strongly valorized by Descartes and Locke and yes. ultimately by Kant, right? And the autonomy and the self enclosedness, uh, right, of reason, right? And the entire Enlightenment product becomes individualistic in a yes. new, in a new way. And of course, it, there's, there's some there's some interesting ironies about that. I, I, you pointed this out in one of uh, I, one of the things I read by you uh, that individualistic cultures actually tend to have a higher rate of self-serving bias, which is one of the primary drivers <laughs> yes, of irrational uh, argumentation. Um, so that that's 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 so there's something that, that I mean you amass a lot of empirical evidence, um, but that's that, so I'm just taking that as a, a gateway. Yep. Maybe this that's model. Fine of the monolithic and also monophasic, you know, only one state of consciousness is mm -hmm. matters. So monolithic, a monologic, monophasic mind, right? Uh, there seems to be increasing evidence that that's sort of going, like it's taken us in the wrong direction. It's actually the incorrect model for how we should understand the emergence, the functionality, and ultimately the normativity regulating um, uh, uh, um, what we call reason. And I want to point something out for the viewers. Completely. It's important to do so. Um, so Greg has developed uh, uh, this around what he's called the justification hypothesis and then further work, and I'll let him unpack it. Um, much more recently and independently, uh, uh, Sperber and Mercer have uh, written some articles in a book called The Enigma of Reason mm -hmm. that is convergent, very convergent, um, almost identical to Greg's um, argument. His was has precedence, has clear precedence, uh, but the fact that uh, they have come to a very similar conclusion using very similar data argues very strongly. It's a convergence argument for this hypothesis being very, very plausible. And so I just wanted to state that. And so, Greg, I mean, I, can you, I'll, I'll be quiet for a while because I want you to lay it out, right? Yeah. Because you, know, you, mm -hmm. have, you, have, you have an account not only of the origin, right? You're doing, you're doing, you're doing the design stance. You're doing the classic move in cognitive science, the reverse engineering. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. How um, what we might call reasoning emerges. And then you do something that's unique to your work. I don't see it as much in Sperber's work, you, mm -hmm. which is very relevant to Socrates and know thyself. You make some deep connections between the emergence of reason and self-consciousness. And this is uh, and then and then you go on to, you know, explain how and why we should now re-understand and reinterpret you know, our reasoning capacities in a much more ecologically um, uh, valid manner. Is that a fair representation? That's a wonderful representation because it hits the key aspects uh, of yeah. the idea. So uh, the set of idea uh, that I now refer to is called justification systems theory, and it has three different components to it. Uh, let's start in the order that you offered. So one component uh, is called the justification hypothesis. And I'll say, if you look at my writings, I used to call the whole thing this, and then I changed uh, about two years ago. Joe Mikulski, a good friend of mine and sociologist, helped me see why it, it just wasn't a good name to call the whole thing a hypothesis. But the hypothesis is a good, because um, it goes right into Sperber uh, and Mercer's work and claim uh, and the parallels, uh, which I was making actually in 2003. Um, and in fact, actually, I stumbled across this idea in 1996, and it changed into 1997. Really changed how I see humanity uh, and humans, and how humans went from primates to people. Right. right? That's, that's a really important point because yeah. um, it, you, you make that point about that. Uh, sorry, I want to. Uh, sorry for interrupting. I just. I no, want no, to, please. I want to put that in as another thing. I want you to talk a little bit more about because yeah. 
you 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 tie this to the, a, a specific in the biological sense, a species difference, right? A specific difference, very clear, right? Very clear, and, and uh -huh. it's deeply it's deeply re relevant to our notion of ourselves as persons. That's right? absolutely true. Right. Absolutely no, true. Right? Okay. So, one more theme, but there, sorry. Yeah. I keep, yeah. Oh, sorry. And, 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 no, it's great. Uh, and in fact, I need to acknowledge. Uh, uh, Peter Osario, is a, for many people don't know him, but he, he developed his own model of uh, psychology called descriptive psychology. And he was very concerned, very similar to me in some ways, uh, at least an aspect of my concern about our definitional systems. And he was very concerned with what are persons uh, and what is behavior and the behavior of persons was what he was trying to uh, develop. And I stumbled across, this is way late, but he helped me understand. And basically what he argued is a person uh, is an, you, you learn to be a person, and that's one of the things that only humans can do. Mm -hmm. And what that means is basically, I'm um, using my language a little bit, it's very congruent, is an entity that is, has self-conscious awareness and justifies their actions on a social stage. Right, right. What person is, well, okay? Right. And he makes an unbelievably interesting point that although empirically the only kind of creatures we know to be persons are human beings, our capacity for imagining and science fiction is replete with persons who are not human beings. Right, 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 right. Jabba the Hutt in Star Wars, you know, he's not a human being, but he's a person. And that shows you the relationship between the concept. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, an operative concept of a person, a self-conscious actor who legitimizes their actions on the stage and takes accountability and responsibility in certain ways, depending on the social dynamics. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is what happened to us, because that's what we do uh, you know, obviously, Socrates, uh, Aristotle calls us a rational animal. We provide reasons, and we rationalize what we do, and that is what makes us very, very different. Okay, uh, at least uh, there's there's analogs in very weak ways. My friend Joe Mikulski asked Jane Goodall. He was talking about the difference between humans, and you know, he's very aware of this and embraces this from a sociological perspective. And he asked Jane Goodall, "So, do the chimps ever do anything like justify their behavior?" And Jane Goodall's like. No, we've never seen anything like that. <laughs> okay. so, so anyway, so there's this issue about what is it that d divides us? Uh, and then indeed, there's the macro system I have, the tree of knowledge. And basically what it says is the person culture plane of existence, which is like a new complex adaptive plane, emerges. And it emerges as a function of a cyclical feedback loop of justification. Mm -hmm. All right. Whereby individuals are justifying propositionally justifying their actions on a social stage, and there's a variation in selection and retention process of that process of justification that happens between dyads and in small groups, and then emerges to create large-scale systems of justification. Right, right, right. And that's what gets us into the, what I call capital C culture, is a way to understand the normative ecology that we reside in, as a system, a set of interlocking networks of large scale systems of justification. For, for example, like the law, my daughter's trying to you know, study law right now and she comes in and tells me, you know, this is what a defendant can do and this is what you have to do. And, and, I'm, and I'm like, yes, this is the professional codification of our social rules of justification right. in relationship yeah. to what's not available. So that's just an example. So what the concept of justification does is it provides a framework that links the person defines what a person is relative to a primate and links that to the large scale concept of culture. Right. Okay. So you, uh, so that's really cool. Now, maybe we could slow down and unpack that a bit because yep. you seem to, you, like, well, I, I, I understand you was arguing that, uh, you know, justification, uh, self-consciousness and language are all sort of co-emerging and co-facilitating each other in an evolutionary fashion. Is that is that correct? That's exactly right. And this allows us now to come back. Thank you for that, because now we can then uh, trail the argument. Okay, and we'll go to Sperber uh, and Mercer's claim, because this is parallel, and then I'll feed in my own thing. Well, there, the title of their book is The Enigma of Reason. Okay? Mm -hmm. Where does reason come from? Uh, and basically, they argued first that it was argumentation, and then justification. Like, and combination of those two is actually where our reasoning came from. Mm -hmm. okay? um, so it is the pro and I love this. And, and this is in fact, this is the, an idea that I had and I, I built it off in a number of different ways. But the argument basically is that once you, as you start to talk and offer, you go from mimetic and broken language into propositional language. Yeah. Yeah. The big you have a propositional yeah. claim. Yeah. All right. And what I think both, you know, what we are saying, what I'm saying and what they're saying is really these propositional claims actually then 
they, they carry weight and, and investment because they're claiming what is and ought to be. And now you have to negotiate that mm -hmm. level, okay? And you have to justify what is and ought to be and argue about what is and ought to be. And you make the point that language uh, makes us especially exposed and vulnerable because, well, right. It, right? because <laughs> it gives other members access to what's going on in our cognition. And that, right. that, that makes us you know, vulnerable in a way in which other organisms aren't vulnerable, right? So, right, right, right. So, so here, so what Mercer, so what they're doing is they're given an ecology argument. Okay, so now all of a sudden we have an ecology, which, by the way, is very relevant to the dialogos. Right. So between, but what, as you mentioned with Socrates and, and the other ideas, there's a vertical intra-psychic dynamic ver as well as a horizontal between dynamic. Right, right. Now I'm going to get to that. So now what we're going to talk about is, well, here's what the key insight that I had because I'm a clinician. I'm getting trained in psychodynamic theory, and right. when look at a lens of psychodynamic theory, you see the self-conscious ego as a rationalizing function. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the lens that you give. And that there's these underlying demands and drives, both from your sort of primitive child animalistic and from an internalized parent, right. and you're self-consciously trying to navigate all of that. Right, 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 right. And you're trying to figure out why you tell people what they do and what you should tell them. And in therapy, we create this very private context. Right? That's very confidential, and I'm very giving so that I can get to what's all underneath right. the layers of defense. Right, right, right. What I'm learning how to do. Okay. So, and then uh, basically, I stumble across this justification idea, and there's the interpersonal emergence of culture dynamic. But now, here's the real issue. This is what really separates this idea. Okay. It's a reverse engineering idea. Right. Okay. So everyone, like Sperber and Mercer and so many people, see human language is so different than other, and gosh, what was all the capacities? And then it does allow us this cognitive widgets and, and unbelievability, yeah. right? And, and then maybe it's argumentation and justification interpersonal here, but, but here's the issue, intracyte, okay? John, tell me the worst things you've ever done in the world and tell it publicly to everybody here. Okay? So you don't want to do that, right? You know, you don't want to talk about your unbelievable weaknesses or the times that you were selfish and all of that. And yet what language does with its questioning is it allows me a highway into your subjective consciousness in a way that's just totally different than, you know, I have a dog. My dog just unfortunately, not unfortunately, but he just got neutered and he's in a lot of pain, I presume, right? Sure but I don't know what's really bothering him. <laughs> I can't ask him what he's done and blah, blah, blah. And he can't ask me, why did you do this to me? Yeah. Right? Bertrand, Bertrand Russell once famously said, uh, no matter how eloquently a dog barks, it can't tell you that its parents were poor but hardworking. There you go. <laughs> right? Right? Or, or, or be, betrayed him and then struggle with whether or not you throw your parents under the bus. Right, 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 right. And then what would that mean? And if you do throw them under the bus, they'll come back at you and other people might see you. And at the same time, if you don't, you then deal with all the traumas that they yep, yep. Uh, hurt you. Well, now, well, there you go. Now you're faced with a problem of what I call the problem of social justification. Mm -hmm. The problem of social justification is the idea that language now creates an ecology where, uh, whereby the transparency between us grows okay, right. exponentially. And if you have your private room, to use a Wittgensteinian notion, okay, and we can talk about sort of the complications with that, but I'm using that intentionally, you may not want your diary of your private room to be exposed, but language opens it up for us in a way that's radically different. So then the question is, how do you manage that? And the argument is, is that the self-consciousness system, a private internal narrator, evolves to become a justifier. Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. All right. So, and then you look at the structure of self-conscious awareness relative to uh, subconscious and, and emotional and perspectival perceptual awareness and the social environment. And you make very clear predictions about the kinds of uh, structures we would expect that reporting system, that logic system, that narrating sense-making system to say about oneself. Okay. And like, for example, self-serving biases, it would make a prediction that depending on the social context, but if it, you want, generally want to take credit, something goes well, you get an A on a test, hey, it's because I'm smart and study. Right. An F on the test is because you're a lousy professor, John, and you gave me and you treated me unfairly, right? That's a natural why, because that kind of justification narrative preserves my influence and investment, my worth in a particular way, and I can narrate that to myself and others in other 
context. Of course, I have to be careful because nobody likes a narcissist. So now you have the whole dynamic about how you create a justification system, which by the way, I would argue, welcome to yourself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I look at myself and I'm like, well, yeah, that's actually a good description of a lot of the dilemmas that I've had. Yeah, I, I like this notion because it's very much like what Moore argues in Socrates that you don't discover the self uh, primarily through introspection or uh, by just sort of uh, stating what you believe. You discover the self by what you will commit to within a social context. Right. Um, um, mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Because then you obviously, one of the things that this thing, uh, that's part of the larger system is that we're very motivated, uh, and this is pretty commonsensical, but I do it, you know, to maintain our social influence, our yeah. sense of relational value, our place in the social matrix, right? right? Uh, so, so if the crowd is going one way, right, and you stand up and you say, well, I think you guys are all full of crap. Well, you know, that's that, uh, good luck. I mean, you know, that's a dangerous thing. Some yeah. people certainly, depending on all sorts of factors, can do that, but almost everybody say, look at every, like at the teenage years, um, what the crowd is doing. I mean, I work with a lot of teenage yeah. um, troubled individuals and we see trouble, psychological trouble, really exponentially jump in the modern world uh, in the teenage years, okay? Why? Well, this provides a very clear understanding that what happens in, the, in adolescence is the emergence of a stabilizing identity self-concept. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. For kids that are five, it's contextual. They certainly have a sense about how to justify. Did you eat the cookies? No, mom, absolutely not. Okay. Because they don't want to get punished in a particular way. But by the time you're 12, you're carrying around an image of yourself and you can abstract formally across a wide variety of contexts. Now you have to think about, well, who are you? How do you get influence? Who are you really relative to who do you present yourself as? And you get all sorts of imposter syndrome, self-critical kinds of issues and things along those lines. Well, there's two points I want to, there's one that seems uh, the evolution about the interpreter. And then the, the second point um, is um, this idea that uh, I, I think you have it too, but I, 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 it's clear in Sperber and Mercer that, um, what, that uh, individual reason sort of doesn't work very well, but collective reason works very well. So let, but let's go to the first one because... Um, <laughs> Because it looks like, I mean, you, you, you do, you do uh, go in and you say, you know, there are organisms, they're few in number, uh, uh, and they have, you know, very developed brains and they're, they're social creatures like us that do have evidence of self-awareness, mm -hmm. uh, some kind, you know, um, and we have some evidence of them having some minimal awareness, you know, of the, per of the perspective of their cohorts. Like they, they, you know, they, they'll hide things, right? Yep, they'll absolutely. Turn their backs, so, right? They're not, I mean, stuff like that. All of that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and then Proust in, in her work on uh, the philosophy of metacognition, she said, we have to be careful to distinguish two kinds of metacognition. There's the one in which we're doing something like self-narration. Yep. And there's a procedural form which is I'm self-modeling so that I can monitor and manage myself as I'm moving around my world, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so it's very plausible that many organisms have some, and because we're even finding this in robotics, if you give the robot, if you get the robot to model itself before sure. it models the world, it does much. So you get self-modeling and then you have that sort of procedural metacognition. And then it looks like what you're suggesting is that that can get exapted into being something like this interpreter. Uh, right, right, absolutely. So, um, so certainly you can imagine, right, why there would be a metacognitive functioning to feed back and afford, say, a more optimal grip on the environment for other non-linguistic non animals that have cortical and, and especially social structures, okay? And, there's, and, and you see, you know, uh, mirroring uh, awareness and other kinds of indications of self-reference, okay? But it's, it's just a radically different environment uh, when you have the narrative linguistic highway open up. Yeah, very yeah. much, very much. You know, and so now, now not only do you have to think about yourself in action, you have to think about giving your accounts to other people. Yeah, with the story. And that's, that's the story of the self is what, is what fun, yeah. So the metacognitive piece of the story of the self then really becomes the, the human person, private, public narrative. I wondered if your if uh, your argument I think it could be strengthened if you integrated it with uh, Daniel Kudo's work on the narrative practice hypothesis. Uh, mm -hmm. Narrative actually really enriches. Our, it's it's a particular way of using language and imagery 
that really allows us to pick up on other people's mental states. Because he said, the problem with trying to determine your behavior is uh, I actually can't do, I can't just, you know, the, the old model, belief plus desire equals behavior doesn't work. Right, because, right, right. Like, how, do you how do you tell if somebody's eyes twitching or winking? And how do you tell if the wink is lewd or uh, <laughs> Right. And so I need to know, I need to follow a lot of history. I need right. to know the character. I need to know the context. I need to know what everybody's intention is. I need what possible outcomes you might be. I need narrative structure. I need plot. And right. He, he says this whole totally. narrative practice. And as he said, that's why cultures practice narrative and practice. Absolutely. And practice. Absolutely. A powerful way of building our mindset abilities. Brilliant. Brilliant. And yes. And, and in fact, actually, I talk all the time about, well, actually, what was framing us socially in the socio-cultural context is the justification narrative. Right, 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 right. Okay, right, which right. is the story of the self that legitimizes who I am and what I'm doing and legitimizes or not you and what you're doing. So it's, it's absolutely along those lines. And I agree that that lineage could be strengthened and informed by that work. And there's an enormous amount of detail. In fact, that's why I love the idea. It's a hub of idea that takes lots of other people's yeah, ideas. Yeah those ways in which their brilliant work can be built upon it and then create a, a hub that then ties a lot of that work together. I, I mean, this is one of the reasons, uh, I mean, because there's a lot of work now on how the, the platonic dialogues, we've been, we've been misreading them because we have this enlightenment perspective of, you know, the monophasic, monologic, uh, monolithic mind, right? And all we yep. do is track the arguments, right? Uh, and, and what we're leaving out um, a lot of people, you know, Drew Highland and, the, and lots of people, uh, 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 Drew Highland comes to mind immediately, but lots of people arguing, you know, no, but the drama, because a way of life is being justified and made attractive to people. And the drama has a particular narrative structure, right? And dialogical, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and that's just as important. And you can't actually get Plato's philosophy if you just extract the arguments. Right. So, and that's exactly, I mean, and so the, what I call the problem of social justification is essentially what gives rise to this reasoning dynamic, which means that it, it, it evolves in a social relational context. Okay? Right. And so that's, abs and it is that iterative process. And think about every one of us, you know, uh, what was it, James Mark Baldwin who said, ego and alter are born together. Okay? Right, right. And that's, that's both because we have an intuitive social relational system, our attachment system, our mirror neurons, our tracking others, the importance of our place in the social world. Mm -hmm. But as humans, then we are born into a socio-ecological thicket, okay? And then it is the process of negotiation around that thicket that gives rise to the collective intelligence. Right. And the opportunities of things like emergence of a wisdom in the crowds and our, all of our intuitive perspectives in relationship to being able to see what none of us can see individually, and the process of creating context, and this is what I think your wonderful project really is about, is creating a context to maximize that. Yeah. yeah. So taking advantage of that, um, as opposed to say our current, uh, in the United States at least, so, you know, not to get political, I would argue our current political context is absolutely antithetical. Yes. Uh, yeah. you know, because of its polarization, it's creating stupidity across it's collective stupidity, basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, so, so then, what we need to do, the transition that we need to make right now in the next 20 years is create a collective intelligence system, a distributed network, a collective intelligence system that maximizes wise justifications. And that is an interpersonal uh, dialogical process. Right. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I'd say two, two things there. Well, I think what we're primarily justifying um, is not beliefs, ultimately, but we're justifying ways of life. Um, and identities that can be taken. We're ultimately trying to justify personhood, not our, our, our particular conclusions. And I think we need to bring that back as central. So this brings up, this is a perfect segue to the point that I wanted to come back to, uh, uh, which is this idea that uh, individual reason, uh, that, you know, that, that model is actually fraught. And we have just overwhelming evidence, you know, that this is the other enigma, right? That Sperber and Wills, uh, not Sperber and Wills, and Sperber and Mercy talk about it. You know, why have we, we seem to have this superpower, but it, it seems to really not be working very well. You know, there's all the evidence of all the bias, all the self-deception, and I go on a lot about this in my work, right? And then they have the idea, and I think you do too, right? Yeah. But if you take these individualistic things, these things that look 
like they're malfunctioning individually, and you put them into the dynamic system of distributed cognition, you actually get really powerful and wonderful results. I agree, absolutely. Uh, and, and indeed, I mean, if you look at the structure of the way hunter-gatherer systems organize themselves, mm -hmm. okay, they hated dominance. They were really anti-dominance hierarchies, right? Why? I think the reason they were doing that is because they're cultivating a distributed collective network right so of the various roles of hunter gatherer intelligence to be brought to bear you know um along those lines and i think that we have have grossly erred on the idea that one person you know we have the iconic newton solving for f equals ma you know and that that is then the idealized uh transcendental ego of kant and all of that stuff and that's just um that's I think that's grossly mistaken on many, many levels. I think it's grossly mistaken at the level of value, first of all. I think fundamentally we seek relational value in networks. Yeah. You know, We want to be known and valued and want to matter to other people and matter to ourselves. That's yeah. actually at the core of our, as a psychotherapist, I'll tell you, what do people really worry about? Yeah. Yeah. Not mattering and, and relational value at the yeah, core. Totally, totally. That's, and, that's in the meaning in life literature too. Very yeah. good. I know, absolutely. And what do we really want to do? We want to participate. This is like in a religio fashion. We want to participate in what we think ontologically matters and tell ourselves metaphorically matters and create mythos about that collectively. Yep. Right, right. Yep, yep. That's what we want to do. So, um, and, and, and we do it the best when we do it together. Yes. And so I think that, I think that's what the, these are massive transformations that need to hit from modernity and it's idealization of self-interest in the individual uh, to a you know yeah. meta modern modernity that actually embraces the collective um, and does so wisely. And I keep coming back to wisdom because it's fundamental meta values that we need to we need to be framing. What is it uh, that makes a you know a flowering eudaimonic picture of a person and the polos yeah. you know uh, the, the, the collective uh, group? Well, I mean, there's two things that come out of that right away. One is, is the uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, our capacity for person making is, is right. And, and, uh -huh. and making the conditions of person making agape is very, yes, yes. which, which, yeah, uh, the, a, a broad interpretation of Christianity, as you know, basically, yeah. uh, yeah. is, is to give the love to allow the other person to flower. I mean, there's a garden behind me because I take a lot of that metaphor in relationship to, you know, how do we shower relational value or love agape? Right. onto each other and actually mutually maximize it. That's actually the socioeconomic problem that we should be, in my opinion, focused on. I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I mean there's, you present research and other people have presented research that the individualistic cultures, um, <laughs> ironically, uh, you know, they tend to have much more of self-serving bias, which is at the core of a lot of how people you know, do poorly in reasoning tasks and argumentation. Tasks. So when, where you know, if you're highly individualistic, you're actually much more likely uh, to give in to confirmation bias and other things like that. Whereas if you're in a collective culture, that's much, I mean, there's difficulties there. I'm not saying collectivism is the answer or anything, but I'm saying we've, we've got this weird idea. I, I think, you know, that somehow individual reason is the pristine case, but the empirical evidence really cuts against that dramatically. Absolutely. And, and, and trying to therefore create a value system based on the individual, like sort of the individual atomically, individualism, put mm -hmm. it that way. I think is is deeply uh, mistaken uh, because it's, it's it's just sort of misrepresenting things. I think that's also part of why you know, and I've had some really good discussions about this with Rafe Kelly, and he's helped me moderate what I'm saying. But this is why I'm, I've been a little bit critical also of the hero archetype being so valorized in our culture because yep. it tends to be aligned with that whole individualism thing that is actually very detrimental to rationality and overcoming self deception and affording you know, collective intelligence, the kind of collective intelligence, which is the only place in which our norms are created. This idea that we can be self-normative, that we can create norms purely for ourselves. I mean, that has been subject to so much devastating criticism. Um, that it, does, I, it barely even makes any sense. That's, that's, yes, it does. It does. I, mean, I mean, you know, that the entire normative culture is to create a large-scale system that coordinates us in relation to yes. our collective values. I mean, that's what it's doing. I mean, creating a normative system, if you lived on alone on an island, I mean, really what you would be doing is creating an, and we know this clinically, is whatever projected interjects that you're carrying around. Yeah. And I, don't know, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with like internal family systems, uh, but there are therapeutic approaches that basically say that my 
personality, you know, like Freud obviously decided, you know, and argued there were these sub personalities. Well, in the therapy world, that they, people have taken that, and I think very, very legitimately, to the internal working models of the roles that we internalize about ourselves and essentially carry around a family of multiple selves. Yeah, um, well, I mean, that's because, the, you know, the, how the brain, how various parts of the brain are modeling each other is not functionally very different from how one brain tries to model another brain, right? Um, so th th that's, of course, important. I was thinking of, of, of Tom Hanks and Castaway, how he has to get Wilson. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I mean, he even puts Wilson up there, right? Just, yeah. just to, have, to have a mirror at an intuitive level, right? A self-other positional stuff and somebody to talk with. And yeah. certainly for myself, every time I try to do a paper, okay, or, or try to come up with a new idea, I bounce. It just intuitively comes to me to bounce into all the positions of the critic, positions of the supporter, positions for people on the sidelines. In other words, you jump into the roles. Uh, so you play out a multiplicity of different dialogues, argumentations, justifications in your own head. Uh, yeah. That's how else you reason. And when we do it well together, that's what's going to generate the best collective intelligence. Which means, therefore, that the mimetic, uh, the mimetic, our mimetic abilities uh, and how they inhere within our perspectival knowing are much more integral to being rational than we've previously given appropriate credit to. Perspectival Absolutely. knowing is doing a, a lot of heavy lifting that we have really marginalized and backgrounded um, in, in, uh, in our current understanding. Well, that's, uh, you know, I know you've had some really stimulating conversations with Ian McGilchrist, you yeah. know, uh, in relationship to this whole point. I mean, the Western logos, the Western idealized individualistic rational logos, you know, is completely imbalanced. It's, it's great at one level, but it's not, it needs to be contextualized. And there's so many other different aspects of human context, right, that we need to, that we're out of balance around. And so if we're going to move into the 21st century in a right, more holistic and sustainable way, clearly getting in balance in relationship to perspectival knowing, recognizing our phenomenological needs uh, and how crucial those are to meaning making and harmonizing. I mean, go to a rock concert and everybody's jiving together around music, which is all intuitive, participatory, perspectival, not logos. It's all salience manipulation in a, in a, yeah. in a good, uh -huh. serious play. So, I mean, in this, your, your point there that converges with, indi you know, again, with independently generated work, you know, by Baltus, Baltus and Stottinger, that you know, if you give people a sort of a, a wisdom task, which they're you know, trying to decide what the right thing to do, and you ask them to imagine talking to somebody else they do much better than if they just stay in their own head. Or, uh, you know, Igor uh, Grossman, a colleague and friend of mine, you know, all the work on the Solomon effect. People tell me one of your worst problems and people describe it and they, they say, now describe it as if a friend was describing the same problem. And they get insight and realization by just by taking that other perspective, right? And, and, and all that sort of work um, just that keeps coming and pointing to how dialogic, mm -hmm. Well, and I'll tell you, I'll say at a clinical level, it's unbelievably important because what happens to people yeah. is it, when they get vulnerable inside, they feel neurotic, they then don't generally want to share that because then it makes them look weak. So they create a public out here and then hide what's going on to here, right? And then they become, not in a narcissistic way, but in a perspectival way, in a parasitic thought way, they become completely self-absorbed. Right, 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 right. Meaning they just talk into themselves about what it is that's going on. And then we know from like a cognitive therapy perspective, they develop rigid and absolutist beliefs about their feelings, about who they are. Right. And no dialogue that allows them to actually engage in a process of wondering about it. In fact, that's what cognitive therapy is about. It's like, bring it to somebody else, start to get out of your head and begin to analyze this in other ways with right. other people. You know? Right, right, right. That's really cool. I mean, and there's therapies that bring in the perspectival. I, I, you know this better than I do, like sort of emotion-focused therapy and, right. Absolutely. Well, and specifically, actually, mentalizing therapy. I don't know if you've ever heard of Peter Fine's. Fine. No, no, I don't. But it's specifically, uh, it's for individuals that have personality problems, and it's called mentalizing. And what you do is you explicitly put yourself in the role of other people. I mean, that's, the extra, that's why it's called mentalizing. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, absolutely... So, so let's just be clear all, uh, that, that an idealized individual rationally deducing what truth is, is an unbelievably bad model. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <that's> <laughs> a community of individuals that have some collective shared framing, but then allow for distributed network and emergence uh, of toward whatever would be good in that context. And so this means we have to bring in, you know, we have to connect to uh, the perspectival and the participatory. We have to have 
things that connect symbol on together, the collective and the individual. So a lot of symbolic, uh, uh, you know, enacted stuff, and it's going to be collective, and, it, and it's going to be, it's, and it's, you know, a prototypical thing that bridges between that is ritual behavior. You have an individual yep. doing something, but it's often from a third person perspective with, with other people around. So what I'm saying is, is it, it sounds like, you know, reason is going to be situated within all of this machinery, and you, you explicitly bring this up, that has typically been called religious, right? Yes. Because religion seems to be the software that runs distributed cognition for managing all of this kind of stuff. Completely, completely. And what it does is it provides you just a shared identity and set of practices that cultivate collective meaning making together, mm -hmm. you know, which is what you know, we're engaged in. I mean, I, I, I love, I don't know if it's true, but uh, the idea of uh, Aslan's God, a human history, uh, he speaks to the, that the idea of basically was people are building more and more temples 10,000 years ago, like the temple at Gobleki, I don't know how to say it exactly, it's in Turkey, 12,000 years ago. It's like, you know, why did we build architecture? I mean, uh, agriculture. Uh, agriculture sucked at first as a way of life, you know. But he argues is because we start building these temples. Yeah, and the he, temples are built before the Neolithic Revolution. Exactly. Yeah. That's what the idea is. And then, and what happens is if you're building temples year-round, right, the, then you got to live there. You can no longer be nomadic. It's, they're too big, and so then you have to create our agriculture as a necessity that, that emerges out of the function of the size of the temple. Right. What does that actually translate into in terms of the modern age? I love telling the new atheists, by the way, I used to be a new atheist, but I love telling you, it means that the concept of God it gave rise to modernity. <laughs> modern religion you know, was birthed by the concept of God. So, so for me, I, you know, I believe in the concept of God. You know, I don't make any supernatural claims about theism, but I believe in the concept of God. And, that's what I, and I think if we flip it around and say, well, what do we mean? We mean Tillich's ultimate concern. Right, yeah, yeah. It's a eudaimonic ultimate endpoint that gives us heaven on earth, to use a Jordan Peterson frame. I mean, yeah. you know, that's and that and the you know one of the things that modernity did and its materialistic flatland is, is set the stage for us to you know dissociate. And I know you know this more than anybody, but it's it's you know I was talking to a friend of mine. I'm actually putting this in my book, and not a friend, but a, a nephew of mine came back his first year of college. It's like, oh, what did you learn? Basically, that I'm a bunch of chemicals. <laughs> and, you know, so he had a neuroscience course and a reductive sort of analytic philosophy course, and you know, he learned that, and and so he's like, yeah, all of this stuff is just brain based. And I'm like, you know, my 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 brother and you know, they paid, paid a lot of money for that conclusion. That's not, you know, we don't uh, materialistic flatland is not ideal. So yeah, we got, the 21st century has got to reorient our collective meaning making systems absolutely, and and I'm now at a place to embrace calling that. Yes. So, I mean, so this is wonderful. So, I mean, it, it's, it's providing a very powerful context, uh, a context of justification, in fact, uh, for the project that I'm engaged in, which is, well, what is the psychotechnology, or maybe Jordan Hall's term is better, what's the meta-psychotechnology that we can recover? And also maybe, I, I like the word inventio, uh, it's Latin, <laughs> right? Because it means both to discover and to make, and, and, right. it, and it's sort of. And and Kerry does this wonderful thing, is because he talks about uh, how um, Augustine basically inventios the 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 inner psyche, right? The the, the inner soul, mm -hmm. the inner mm -hmm. self. Uh, he sort of discovers it while inventing it. It, it hangs between. Right. right. Well, obviously, you are you you are the absolute genius of that, right? With your point of realization. Yes, yes. Well, All right, so eventio realizations. I mean, you know, when I dawned on me, but you made both the, the, the Janus face, two sides of the coin of realization, I was excited about that the whole damn day. I mean, that, was, that, is, that is one of the most brilliantly placed words. I just need to say this on, you know, it's one of the most brilliantly placed words uh, that I've ever seen in terms of a name. Or something, so. Thank you. I, I was saying yes to uh, the, the double faced nature of realization, not to <laughs> the, the attribution of brilliant. Right. Um, right. But, um, uh, thank you for saying that. Uh, so, I, I, yeah, I, I think that's really, really important. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to get at then is the inventio of dialectic as a meta psychotechnology that will curate and constellate, feed from and feed back to, you know, an ecology of practices. But this meta -psycho psychotechnology, its job is to, as you say, optimize. Right. All of this. Optimize yes, it as much absolutely. as you possibly can. Right. Right. So, 
and, and then the question is sort of what we need to do to bring together to create that meta framing yeah. that then creates sort of the lattice for the participatory vines of dialectical exchange to grow around. Yes, yes, yes. Okay? Exactly. So that's the way I would, uh, you know, I'd think about it. Um, and in fact, so inside of my system, the way I, uh, I develop what are called ultimate justifications. So the ultimate justification is the justification of justifications. Right, right. Okay. And that creates the load star or, and for me, what that is, is B, that which enhances dignity and well-being with integrity. Right, right. Okay. So these become big three meta values, dignity, uh, well-being, and integrity become meta, and I mean meta-cultural, meaning that I see them as moral relational universals, mm -hmm. that transcends culture, uh, and then create a sort of a wisdom a complex as it were right right and why these three ideas and what they how they interrelate but it's just an example and, and i would say that what we need at an attitudinal level around this is what i call an integrated pluralism meaning somebody might bring agape for instance right. that's a beautiful value of course right. love or freedom you know of the individual any number of kind of potential metal values and you'll see like all the universalist kind of church and wisdom traditions they're integrated pluralistic, meaning that they emphasize different aspects, but man, is, if there isn't a center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's very much, uh, yeah, I've said it's, uh, I, I, that's why I reject both perennialism, which says they all say the same thing, and relativism, which says they don't say anything in common. And it, it's more, I, I use a model that's like, like uh, from deep learning. Uh, like you, you, you can see, you can see like there, there's sort of, uh, you can, extract what's invariant but you also have to pay attention to what varies between them and if you move back and forth you actually get uh, you know you get a deep learning from all of them so a, a procedural relationship to them rather than trying to grasp the final propositions from them right and so uh, pluralism is what's variant and integrated with what's invariant exactly 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 you know yin yang dialect around that concept so you're, I, and so uh, I think that's exactly right you have to you have to try and figure out uh, what that uh, what that, sh what that, uh, well, you, uh, you called it all of a justification. And we also said it's sort of, uh, sort of, uh, your, your bedrock normativity, um, yep. perhaps exactly. I'm, I'm, and I, I think that's totally important. I'm not dismissing it. I'm trying to also do the, the reverse engineering of the practice, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to figure out uh, the best model we have from our own past, which is mm -hmm. dialectic and that whole history. Yep. And and it had both these dimensions and Chris Master Pietro and I are doing a lot of work on this. I'm also doing work with, you know, Peter Lindbergh and I've mentioned that and also yep. a guy. I was on the story yesterday, uh, Thursday. Great, I'm gonna take, I'll watch that. That's great, great stuff Peter's doing. Yeah, yeah, great. So, you know, dialectic has this interpersonal, intrapersonal and then ultimately transpersonal dimensions to it, the three dimensions, right? Yes. I'm trying to put that, get that as clear as I can because we can't go back there. We, can't, we don't live in ancient Greece. But, right. and, and then put that into dialogue, right, with all these emerging authentic discourse practices that are all springing up because there's a yes. vacuum. And there's a vacuum. To fill Absolutely. That and then try right. to get top down and bottom up to talk to each other as deeply as possible. I, I mean, it's a brilliant description. You know, it's a brilliant description. I'll add a couple of pieces, especially since we're on a uh, justification dynamic here. Please. Okay. Um, so according, if we follow justification systems theory, what emerges first is the problem of justification in general and social justification in particular. Right. Okay? So if I'm making propositional claims, you, it's easy to ask questions once we have that cognitive architecture. Just hang out with a four-year-old, yeah. all right? And they'll be, why are you bald? Why is sky blue? Why is this? And now eventually, that's the way it is, kid. <laughs> you know, it's like, and, and so, so we have the problem of justification, the problem of social justification. How do you explain? And that gives rise to, and now, we, now we're involved, okay? And then we see the evolution of culture, 100,000 years, you know, 50,000 years, it's definitely exploding, right? But what happens with the ancient Greece, in, 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 in ancient Greece is unbelievably different and important. And, and really, I think you can locate uh, what happens with Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato as a fundamental transition in processes of justification. Right, right, right. What does Socrates really develop? And from my view, he basically develops formal epistemology. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by that is, well, justify your terms, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so he basically realizes that social pragmatic justification doesn't necessarily stand up to absolute epistemological truth justification. 
Commission. He sees the difference between those two in a fundamentally different way and builds the dialogical technology that helps us become aware that maybe we're all just a bunch of bullshitters. Right, 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 right. Right? And then how do you know when you're not? That's what he basically is asking, right? In a very, very powerful way. And then trying to create this ecology of trying to detect bullshit. Now, if we keep that going, okay, then we realize, all right, we get into, um, ultimately, I think that gives rise to science eventually, that, that, you know, in terms of empiricism, the empirical addition to that, all right? And I've got, I love science, and I am a scientist, but I have my critique of modernist science and what it did, okay? Uh, and ultimately, what we need, and, and the whole enlightenment modernist way of thinking, okay? Right. Which prioritize objective uh, analytic, reductive truth and individualism yep. in a way that is, it needs to be recontextualized, both in terms of systems thinking, big picture systems thinking, and relation. We need to bring the relational social pragmatic back in mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. a particular way and create a scientific humanistic philosophy or macro religion that informs how we educate our children and informs right. how we relate, how we go across the various lines. So what well, what I'm basically saying is I can take the concept of justification, I can trail it through the evolution of culture, right? I can then think about culture as large scale systems of justification, and I can trail up sort of then what are the ultimate justifications that would ideally organize a large scale system at the level of value that cultivates wisdom. And that's where I get my big three. But that's, uh, that's really good. That's really good. your architecture, what you're seeing about what it is that we need to do. And I take this idea of justification, you put those two set, kinds of things together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can that's really see a lot of. Yeah, uh, yeah. We have to keep working there. together. That's very clear. That's very clear. So, I, I think, you know, we're running out of time, but I, I want to give you the opportunity to put up that wonderful diagram you have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe uh, gonna... take it, take us through it. Uh, yeah. And um... so. should be sharing my screen. Here it is. Okay. It is. Great. Okay. Okay. So um, let me just orient you to this. Okay. Orient the viewer to this. This is a map of human consciousness. That's what it's designed to do. Right. Um, and there are, it argues that there are three key domains of human consciousness. One is your perspectival phenomenological domain. Right. Okay. I often now refer to this as mind too, but it is your integrated sense of being in the world and John is an absolute expert on what consciousness might be, and I'm learning greatly from him. That's just a side note, okay? Um, but uh, so, so this is this is the emergence of, say, whole brain activity gives rise to a global neuronal workspace that is yeah. our experience of being. Um, then this is you have a private narrator, okay? So this That's is the interpreter you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Exactly. So this is the self-consciousness interpreter, and in fact, we can see uh, anybody is familiar with Michael Gazanica's work. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Left hemisphere interpreter really shows at a very mechanical way. <laughs> the left hemisphere just generates justifications for what it is doing uh, when it doesn't even know what's going on. Um, but so this is this the problem of justification and the mechanics of self conscious uh, narrative reflection. Right. And this is what you actually share when you talk to other people, what you decide that you will allow them to see. Right. So now, if we go to your articulation about, well, what is the dialogos? Right. When we talk about horizontal, we're talking yeah. about in between right here, okay? Right. And we each need the vertical work. Yeah, very much. Very down much. from the self-consciousness into our subconscious, and you see this thing called the Freudian filter. Right. The argument is, is that we want, our narrator wants us to be good. We right. want to be important. We want to be intelligent, okay? That, that creates a bias of desire uh, so that we tell the story of ourselves in a particular way, all right? Um, now we know for clinical reasons, lots of reasons why people will get trapped almost in the opposite of that and all sorts yeah, yeah. of dynamics that go on. But fundamentally, we know from a basic psychodynamic perspective that there's a, hor a vertical alignment of the self-consciousness system into the phenomenological experiential and then into the dynamic unconscious, like yeah. in other words, your shadow, right? So the Freudian filter is very much like what would be hiding behind your personal shadow. It's the attentional filter, what I'm talking about a lot when I'm talking about like all the relevance realizations. It's stuff. exactly what that is. So this is how, how does the uh, collective representations that are non-conscious jump onto the screen of experience? Right, 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 right. And then you basically have, you have the emergence of one representation and then if you do a Rosenthal model that I was just learning, and then you have a second representation, okay, a top, more top down, bottom up, you're going to use those terms, 
of awareness and then that pops into your global workspace of awareness. And what you're doing is you're hunting, the attentional system is hunting for salient variables or right. relevant variables in relation to see what kinds of problem, information it needs to solve the problems of what I would call the problems of work effort, which is how do you direct your time and energy to solve problems in living. And, and then what's the Rogerian filter? Is exactly. Like Rogers, the Carl Rogers, is that? It's the, an exact uh, reference to Carl Rogers, okay? And what this is, is that um, there's this highway of information and we want other people to be a particular way and we judge them accordingly, okay? Right. So in other words, you say, hey, you know, I want you to think this way like me and I want you to like me and I want this and the other. So we put pressure on other people and it creates a pressure to then share what we publicly want to share in relationship to social influence. Right, right. Called the Rogerian filter. So if you're familiar with Rogers at all, um, his central insight is that people have what's called, a, he argued, people had an organistic valuing process that's actually would be connected right into the experiential heart. Okay? Right. And that if you let them grow in a non-conditional and loving environment, they will reach their potential. That organistic valuing process knows what's good for them and they will find out full flourishing. Right. But what happens is other people judge them, okay? And because other people judge them, that creates a social split out here and a private true self split in here. Okay. And they become imposters. So it's the ten the Rogerian filter refers to the tension between the judgments of others and how the contingencies that others will place on me if I share what my thoughts are. Right. So and so that's when you're saying, hey, I don't want people to know this about me. You uh, put it's managing that transparency that we were it's talking managing about. that transparency. When yeah. anyone puts a and this filtering process can be done inside, but actually we create a lot of extent you know, an extended mind around this. Right, of course. If, if you yeah. put a lock on your diary. A lock on the diary is an example of the Rogerian filter in the public-private. Why is the lock there? I'm going to talk to myself, and I like writing because that helps me process. I don't want anybody to see that diary. Right, 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 right. right. That's a filter. Right. right. That's amazing. And, and so this is – so what the, the cool thing about this is it both describes the various domains of mind, and it shows their dynamic interrelation inside and interpersonally. And you were talking about, well, we're watching all of these, uh, you know, sort of – uh, to use Peter uh, Lindbergh's term, we're seeing a culture 2.0 multipolar war. Yeah, yeah. Peter do with those 35 little meme plexes. He recognized he had a brilliant job. He diagnosed them, in my term, as yeah. these emerging competing systems of justification. Totally. That's, I, think that's, I think that's completely accurate. I think that's right. right? And they have, a, they have a core idea, and then they have a core opposition, and they have more peripheral things, and then they're major players that have influence and relationship to the right. trust they're trying to advocate for, right? Um, and our danger in this environment is we'll create such a more chaotic multiplex that we will get, uh, that will blow ourselves up because of chaos. Right, 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 right. Or the other danger is a nightmare in 1984, one gets dominant and then they control the internet and yeah, then they, they control they, they, they the they order fight, yeah. right? So there's an order chaos dialectic that we actually have to manage. And so what we need to do is we need to create the right socio-ecological set of practices ideals, values, right? To network these things together so that they benefit from the dialogue rather than tear each other down like the yeah. American Bible. Processing system. rather than adversarial processing. Exactly, exactly, you know? And, uh, you know, that's what the whole game be, at least, you know, it's ex yeah. and I that I happen. But, but basically what that is is so that you and I can sit here and be like, gosh, John, that's a great idea. Let me see if I can riff off of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As opposed yeah. to, hey, my, my tenure is dependent upon ripping your shit down. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, no, that's a nightmare. Yeah, very much, very much. Wow, Greg, well, we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, this has been really, really, really exciting to talk to you and your work and really unpack it. And, you know, I, I, one, of the, one of the markers I make of, of, of dialectic, if dialectic is working and it's creating dialogos, two people can get to a place where they couldn't get to individually on their own. And I, I very much felt like that was happening. I oh, absolutely. And, and, uh, and that's, you know, uh, I've been having a dialogue with you ever since I started the uh, Awakening the Meaning Crisis series. Yeah. And sort of like, and that, I, that, just the framing on that, you know, is exactly, you know, in terms of, so if you look at like the tree of knowledge, okay, so it goes matter, life, mind, culture. And each one of those things, uh, life, mind, and culture are new complex adaptive planes of behavior that emerge as a function of information processing and computational and cybernetic control systems, okay? Cells and genes and 
neurons and animals and people and language. Right. Well, I've always been like, oh my God, as soon as I saw that, I knew that the 21st century would be, we laid the groundwork with the internet and artificial intelligence, the digital landscape is going to be upon us. Okay. Yeah. And that's a novel information processing system. So I've always had the intuition ever since 1997 that the 21st century is going to be unbelievably intense. Right. Mm. When I listened to the meaning crisis, I paired that aspect with the struggle of people trying to justify and the kairos of where we are. In that. Yeah, exactly. That's well said. And, and it just woke me up to the, uh, in a totally new way. So your synergy of that history, right? And the bringing us to the moment and the framing of it in relationship to the meaning crisis and what the entire tree of knowledge system really is, is actually, hey, here's a sense-making system. You know, we need to update the way we think about science. When you think about science, certainly there's the method. We also need to think about science as a structural um, thing to use to get an optimal grip on the world. Yes. And the knowledge basically is about that. And so it's a sense and meaning making stuff riffing off of that. It's very, very synergistic. And, you know, it's been great for me ever since I uh, discovered your, your stuff there, brother. Thank you. Uh, Greg, uh, if you could email me uh, links, uh, uh, like, you know, you know, two or three quick links. Yeah. Uh, uh, Absolutely. You know, that are, are, are focused on what we were talking about today. The justification hypothesis, the justification systems, all of that. Absolutely. That, that would be really wonderful because I'd, li I'd, li I'd like to try and get this uh, video up soon. This one I want up really, really soon. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I'd, I'd love to do, love to do that and be happy to share this. Okay. So, well, we'll we will obviously talk again uh, and keep up your excellent work. And I highly recommend uh, Greg's work. And, and, and those of you who have, have already taken an interest, in Sperber and Mercier's work, The Enigma Reason. I strongly recommend you look at Greg's work. Um, yeah, I strongly recommend it. So thank you. Uh, thank hey you. man, appreciate it. It's been, it's been very uh, excellent dialogue, lots of synergy, lots of fun. Yeah, very good.